Okay, so uh, in the first two parts, we looked at uh, uh, some of the constraints on processing, the speed. We looked at uh, learning very rapidly in the visual system, in the auditory system. We looked at uh, the existence of these feed-forward convolutional neural networks, which apparently can get human levels of recognition in, uh, uh, in architectures which are you know, embarrassingly simple. They don't have feedback, they don't have, uh, uh, they don't have attention, and so on. Uh, but the, the, re the real problem was that the way they, these systems learn is clearly not biological, and as we're interested in memory, it's, it's one thing to have an architecture that we can recognize objects, but if it's, if it's not learned in a, in a sensible way, uh, then that's not much good. So uh, that's just to remind you, everybody knows what that is, right? Okay, except, except maybe <laughs> Alessandro won't know and Roberto won't know. It's a, it's a thing I used in my talk two days ago. It's actually a couple of dances. The other, the other really... Uh, I want to remind you this amazing study with eight minutes of continuous Gaussian noise. The subjects are just looking for little dips in the amplitude, and they, they learn, their brains generate full-blown ERPs to a repeating segment, even though the subjects aren't trying to remember something. That shows that the brain is storing stuff all the time. Uh, and we saw the sort of constraints on processing, which I think uh, um, point towards the feed-forward architectures for recognition. Uh, I've been arguing that uh, the ordering of spikes across neurons is, uh, is, is, is actually a very powerful way of getting information very quickly. We saw that these sort of feed-forward archite architectures, as used now by Google, produce very good performance, but as I was saying, the way they learn is totally wrong. Uh, uh, but in the end, you've got an existence proof. It works. These are, at the top end of this system here, these are actually grandmother cells because they are incredibly selective. And they'll tell you what specific, specific dog breed out of 60 it is, uh, better than uh, the average human, for sure. Okay? So this is, this is a, a but, as I say, the, the way it learns is not the way that we learn. And I was showing you, I started showing you yesterday how a simple STDP model will actually generate selectivity to repeating patterns without any instruction. I just want to um, go a little bit further with that. Um, um, so that was the, 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 the original study that I showed yesterday where we took <coughs> 2,000 afferents with some random spiking and just copied little uh, uh, things. Uh, and showed that a, a single neuron listening to that becomes selective to that pattern because of S STDP. I just want to mention uh, quickly uh, another paper uh, related where you, we had more than one neuron. There were nine neurons in that simulation rather than one. And basically, you know, you, they all, they're all listening to the same stuff coming in, the same 2,000 afferents. <laughs> But they got in competitive inhibition, so they're not allowed to learn the same thing. And what we showed uh, was firstly that when you have these 50 millisecond repeating patterns, one of the neurons, initially the neurons are all firing pretty much randomly, but at the end, after a few, actually not very long, this is a few, few minutes, you've got one neuron firing very soon after the start of the repeating pattern. It prevents the other ones getting back to the beginning, and so you get a sequence of neurons, you have this sort of stack. And, and, and so you transform any random pattern, any duration, into just a ser series of neurons which have um, uh, different timings, and you can then do stuff with those at the next stage. Uh, also in the same paper, we showed that you know, if we have multiple patterns you know, with three neurons, the neurons will tend to each learn one of the patterns. Uh, so it, you know, it really does work rather nicely. Now, that's all toy models. Uh, Let's, let's try and do something a bit more interesting. This is using an architecture which is actually very similar to the sort of feed-forward um, HMAX and Viznet type architectures, except we've got at the top end, we've got um, this STDP rule. And we've got, uh, actually, this is a, a simulation of presenting the system with, these are the Caltech face database, there are, and there are three types of neurons. They're green, red, and, new, uh, and, and blue neurons convolutional networks, that's to say there are, there are copies all over the place. Initially, these are the receptive fields of the neurons, uh, and they start off just random. But every time the neuron fires, it's, it's tending to move its weights towards whatever it, it was that made it fire. And you can see by, this is only after a hundred or so presentations, 
the blue neurons are now have got receptive fields that look a bit like the bottom half of the face, and the, and, and the neuron is firing reliably at the bottom of the face. The red neurons are firing at the top half of the face. And this green, green neurons are now tuned into the eye and the nose. Uh, it chose the eye and the nose purely at random. If you randomised the weights and started again, you'd get some other... You might choose the mouth or something like this. It's, and the point is, this is totally unsupervised. Nobody tells the system to learn faces. It learns faces because that's what the environment contains. You do the same thing with the, motor, the, the Caltech motorcycle database, and you get motorcycle detectors. So the system simply builds itself re representations that cover whatever it is <coughs> in the environment. I think that's actually very useful for the sort of things we're trying to do. Um, that's flashed images. We've done a similar sort of thing with the output of this is Toby Dell Brooks spiking retina. It's a chip which essentially has 128 by 128 pixels, and at each pixel, uh, there are like two neurons. One neuron will, will fire a spike if the luminance increases by 10, 10%, and another neuron will fire a spike if it dec decreases by 10%. And the output of the, this is the output of this, this, this chip in response to the... Well, you can probably guess that the, the camera is fixed in a particular place. Where do you think it might be? It's basically, it's, it's on a bridge looking over a, a freeway. It's actually a, a free, freeway in Pasadena. So you can see the cars going by. So your visual system picked that up pretty quickly, right? Um, now, we fed the output of the 128 by 128 times 2. There's 30, 32,000 uh, different spiking channels out, coming out of this retina. And we feed them into 60 neurons. Each neuron has 30, 32,000 synapses, which are randomly connected to start off with. We're using our really um, uh, simplified STDP rule. All the synapses uh, drop down a little bit when the neuron spikes, except the ones that fired just before. And here, this is the receptive fields of 10 of the neurons uh, at the beginning. They're, they're all random. You can see the, the, there's no structure whatever. Now, uh, this is actually in real time. Uh, the... Whoops. Whoops. Uh, this is... Uh, every time that one of these little receptive fields flicks, it's the neurons fired and it's, fi and it's updating its weights. That's after 12 seconds. After 30 seconds, you're here. And after 90 seconds, you've got little car detectors, effectively. Simply because the spikes that come in tend to... You have packets of spikes that go together, and that's what's being picked up by the system. Now, these are not labelled. Uh, they're, just, they're just spontaneously generated by experience. But in fact, it's very easy to label them. Uh, and in fact, when, if you do, you have a system for counting cars on each lane of the system. So the labelling is easy once you've got the representations. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Labelling is easy once you've got the representations. We didn't need to give, have the labels to train the system up. It it's already, uh, already generates the nice receptive fields. So this is purely unsupervised. So building a complete visual system, I think you could extend that process. You, know, you add more neurons in layer one, you add m more layers. You know, you increase the re re resolution of the input. Uh, you, uh, uh, instead of using boring uh, luminance detectors, you put in some you know, convolutions to do the equivalent of on and off center receptive fields. We haven't really gone, gone that far yet, but it will work, in my opinion. And you can build uh, um, uh, structures, uh, representational structures, just by giving the input. So, you know, you, uh, the, the, once you've got car detectors, you might have trajectory detectors at the next layer. We will we'll pick up the fact that the, a particular <coughs> sequence of neurons in layer one tended to occur uh, together. So it's sort of intelligent vision, I think, rather than saying supervised learning, where you can basically you're stuck with whatever the, your, your, your training data, dis you, you, can, you can train it to do anything you like if you've got the training data. But this sort of architecture, with unsupervised learning, uh, will generate selectivity to anything that repeats, actually. Uh, uh, and so if you train it in a particular environment, it will generate the, 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 the neurons with the representations needed to cover the space of things that are coming in. Um, 
Now, we talked about auditory noise learning the other day. It, we, we had this 48 hours ago. I played these things. I'll, just be, I'll be interested to know whether you can hear any structure in this. So if you remember, the first trial is a no. It, uh, you've never, uh, well, actually, you've heard it once now. See what happens. Need a bit more sound, I think. The second one's going to repeat. Just see if we can, you, can make it, you can tell anything. Third one is a repeat you've actually heard quite a few times now. Third, uh, fourth one you've heard once before. Fifth one you've uh, just once before. Here's the repeating thing again. Just listen to this one carefully. Seventh one is a new one. And I'll just play this one again just to remind you. OK, now that process is real memory. With a bit of luck, some of you might, after 48 hours, still have a, a little bit of a, of a sensation that you can hear that. That's memory. It's sensory memory. And it's the stuff that you can't go back to your rooms or to the bar afterwards and rehearse it in your head. It has to be stored online. And then the consolidation process has to be done. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure how. But anyway, but t 10 repetitions is gen generally enough. Seems appears to be all or long one, and it certainly lasts for weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if it lasts for a lot longer. Now, with the STDP rule, we can actually make a model of that, and that's what Olivia Beachley did in his thesis. So we just had took a really, really bog standard, simple model of the cochlea, where we have, a, you know, a, a, as in the cochlea, you have auditory frequency tuned channels that sort of individually drive leaky integrate and fire cells. So you can take any input signal. In comes a sound. This is actually the output of 64 channels uh, uh, to uh, half, uh, or a second of, uh, of noise. You can see you know, the patterns here. There is no real pattern. But you just feed that into one neuron, OK? And you see what happens. 64 synapses. Uh, we're just using the STDP rule as before. And here, it's a bit complicated, but this, this is the uh, the response of the neuron, we've got one neuron listening to 64 channels of, uh, of spikes. It's the, you know, the auditory nerves has 30,000. This, this, this visual auditory system has 64. The neuron, in it, uh, this is listening to 20 seconds of uh, con continuous noise. Shh. You, can hear the, you can see the neurons firing away about two spikes per second. Every time it fires, it updates the weights, but since nothing ever repeats, it's just wandering around aimlessly, uh, doing nothing interesting. Now we start the training patterns. So this bit here is exactly the sort of thing that we're using in the, uh, the, the acoustical stuff. And you can see that, well, the neuron's firing here. And after, after a few minutes, uh, and uh, actually a few dozen rep repetitions, the now neuron is now firing uh, two packets of spikes, actually, because uh, it's actually the first and second half of the thing are the same. And it's doing it it's beautifully reliably. Now, the, the real killer is we go back to the initial state with continuous refresh noise, and the neuron will never fire again. Or at least it, the probability of it firing is very, very low. I mean, it can fire to, to noise, but you'd have to hit exactly the right six synapses out of 64 within five milliseconds. And it's just very, very unlikely to happen by chance. So in terms of, you know, can, you, uh, can we make really selective cells very easily? Yeah. I mean, I've literally put one neuron connected to the auditory nerve. And in you know, a couple of minutes, it's become so selective that it will never fire to anything except the thing that we trained it with. That's actually quite impressive for a thing which has got almost nothing in it, just SCDP and, uh, and, and so on. Yes? It's a, it's a, so you've got these 64 frequency tuned channels. The one, one at the top is responding to high frequencies, you know, and so on. And it's, uh, and it's basically, it's, all it's doing is sitting around waiting to see whether it's six favorite synapses fired together. And the fact is that with, with true noise, the probability that the six out of the 64 fire within, 60, it, it, within five milliseconds, which is essentially, we've, got, we've set the time constant of the neuron, so it's really, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite selective, right? Yeah. 
Uh, and, and, it, and that makes it, that's all you need. So to explain, to understand why this is so selective, I, I'm going to give you a little illustration. Here's a neuron with 40 inputs. The one I just showed you had 64, but it's very, fairly close. It's got uh, 40 inputs, and let's suppose that four of these work, and the other 36 don't. Okay, so these are binary synapses. And then let's suppose that we've got a clever little circuit that controls how many of the input neurons are allowed to fire within a certain time. So this is just like a counter, which just counts spikes coming in. And once you get to a certain number, it says, thank you very much, that's enough. Now, what you can do is have a sort of an input pattern, which can be coding anything you like, actually, uh, intensity or whatever. This could be the, the frequency, the spectrogram, if it's an auditory system. And then we can do, uh, we can effectively ramp up these, these things until four of the neurons have fired. Okay? And at that point, the inhibition tri triggers and you can't get any more. So the sensory system... Its job is to not let, you know, I mean, the auditory nerve in principle can generate as many spikes as it wants, but the cochlear nucleus, which is the next stage, you know, is a, like a relay, but it's a relay that's got lots of in, uh, fancy inhibition circuits like this, which will only let a certain number of neurons fire within a particular window. Now, it just so happens uh, that in this particular stimulus, the four first neurons to fire are the four that actually work. So you get the count here would be, f would be four, sorry, would be four, and, uh, and that's just not very likely to happen by chance. In fact, you can, you can work out the probability. Uh, it's, 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 it's the equivalent of having a, a hat with 40 little uh, balls in it. Four of them are white, 36 of them are black. You pull out four and you count how many white ones you've got. And the problem of, getting, of you being lucky enough to pick out, by chance, four white balls out of 40 is like 10 to the minus a lot. And that's with 40 inputs. <coughs> so the whole thing is actually controlling the percentage of neurons that fire, which you can actually choose any number you like. Um, you know, here we've got 100 neurons, and as, you know, uh, as neurons fire, you can calculate... Uh, the, you know, the probability of any particular pattern occurring. Now, uh, Steve Ferber, who's a computer scientist at Manchester, calls this N of M coding. I think that's quite right. So with 100 neurons, there are actually 2 to the 100 binary patterns that you could have, which is an absolutely astonishingly large number, about 10 to the 30. But if you control the number that are allowed to fire then things get much more controlled. So, for instance, if you only allow one to fire, you can, calcu you can calculate how many different ways there are to choose a particular number. So there are, there are uh, exactly 100 different ways of choosing one. There are exactly uh, 4,950 ways of choosing uh, two. And as you go up, as you get, by the time you got to 10, let's say, there are you know, uh, uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 13 different ways of choosing those 10. Okay? Now, let's suppose that we've got a neuron that has 10 synapses which work, and we're fixing the number of input patterns to be uh, 10. We can actually calculate precisely what the, the, the distribution of hits are. The maximum you could get is 10, uh, but the problem is you're getting 10 hits when, there are, uh, when, there are, when you're choosing 10 at random is in, you know, almost zero. Most of the time you will get zero or one, maybe two. 5% of the time you get three, 1% uh, of the time you get four and so on. If you set the threshold at, say, six or seven, the probability you do getting more than that by chance is uh, extremely low. You know. And you, just, you can just set your threshold such that, by chance, the neuron will not get enough hits. But the trick is to control the number of inputs. If you didn't control that, if, you know, if as many neurons as you like can fire, then the system won't work. So, uh, so the, the idea that I'm trying to get over is that you, you, by using spike timing and using STDP, you can actually make... Um, intelligent sensory devices which can store information uh, 
you know, even with two layers, just a spiking retina connected to uh, a couple of neurons, you can get un unsupervised ca car counting. Single, a single neuron connected to the most primitive auditory nerve imaginable will detect those repeating patterns. And, you know, my feeling is that, well, give yourself 16 billion neurons and lots of uh, inputs, you know. Uh, you've got 2 million optic nerve fibres, you've got another 60,000 auditory nerve fibres. Stick those into the system, what's it going to do? It's going to pick up and learn the things that happen more fre than most frequently. Starting building up from scratch in, in the auditory and the visual systems. But, you know, who, what's gonna, who's going to say what the limits are? Will you get, you know, sort of uh, detectors for... Uh, complex forms, well, it almost ha has to happen. So the question is, you know, when you say what, what happens when you recognise the Mona Lisa, for instance, you know, clearly there are hundreds of millions of neurons active. Uh, some of them are going to be involved in sort of generic processing. But the question that uh, really I want to get at now is, is there at some point in the system a, a, a localist code that represents the Mona Lisa. And this is, we're really straight on the, the, the question that's been coming up all week. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, uh, 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 and Haim was showing you how you can, you can have systems that can represent whatever you like that are perfectly distributed. But I would argue that there may be an advantage here of, of going, going to the extreme. So let me just say a little bit about... Uh, you know, the, what happens when you recognise a system? This is a, a figure from uh, uh, Tony Zador. So basically, you know, if you take two stimuli, here we've got, here we've got 25 neurons, and, you know, you could have a sort of very distributed thing where all the neurons are always firing, uh, uh, and you can tell which, whether it's B or A. Edmund was showing exactly the sort of thing. Yes, you can, you know, look at how close they are, choose the one that fits best. Or you could have much more um, um, stronger, uh, uh, more sparse things. And the question of how sparse it is, is it's a sliding scale. You can, you can actually choose where, wherever you want. Um, the population sparseness is one measure. It's the, the proportion of neurons active at any one time. Here it's all of them. Here it's you know, maybe less. But you can, you can uh, uh, vary that one. But there's also the lifetime sparseness, which is the probability... That are, uh, what proportion of the time is in any particular neuron active? And that's a very unknown number, right? It's usually the same. Ah, well, for the neurons that have activity. But uh, what you don't know is whether, whether there are some neurons which you just don't seem to get to record and could have a lifetime sparseness extremely low. Uh, we don't know. I think, I, think, I think everybody has to admit we don't know the answer to this one. It leaves open the option of cortical dark matter. Now, this is another thing I think is quite useful. This is Peter Foldiak's uh, thing. This is, you've got 10 stimuli and 10 neurons. And you can, uh, one means that the neuron responds uh, in response to a stimulus. Now, you might think, oh, this looks, this looks fairly, you know, fairly uniform. But actually, if you look closely, uh, here, this is a local code. Stimulus 4 only activates cell number 5. But you've also got cell number, uh, the, uh, the stimulus number seven, which activates a sparse representation with two neurons out of ten. But you've also got stimulus nine, which activates five out of ten. So we've got local, sparse, and dense in, in the same thing. And in the other way round, you've got broad, broadly tuned neurons. Neuron number nine is firing to five stimuli out of ten. Neuron number uh, six to two out of ten. Uh, and, and this is the grandmother cell. Now, these are all in the same thing, and, and trying to work out by recording from one neuron whether it's sparse, uh, uh, dense, uh, local, grandmother, narrow, or broad is actually not easy. Uh, uh, it, it, all of the neurons are firing you know, reasonably, uh, uh, and even in this simple thing. So if you imagine now, it's not 10 inputs and 10 outputs, it's a million inputs and you know, 16 billion outputs then there's a huge space. And I don't think we can make uh, uh, decisions, you know, just like that. I think we have to really study this one. So on the question of whether grandmother cells exist, well, in monkeys, you know, uh, there's face-selective cells that Edmund will say are not grandmother cells, of course. Uh, there are, I mentioned uh, these bimodals. This is, you know, this is my thesis stuff. This is a banana cell that has a visual response to a banana and a taste response. 
Um, but then we got, uh, you know, historically, when you ask you know, who's actually been seriously proposing grandmother cells, um, you can count them on, on the fingers of one hand. Jersey Konorsky, 60-70, talked about gnostic cells. Horace Barlow, 72, cardinal cells. There was somebody called Alberta Galinsky wrote a book where she talked about cognons, but I've, I've never met this lady. I, I, anyway, she's one of the few people who go, it's sufficiently mad to go down in print saying this. Uh, a guy called Simon Thorpe back in 1989 wrote a, 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 a review in a, in a totally obscure uh, uh, journal where I argued actually all the arguments in, against local grandmother cell coding don't really hold up. Yeah, sorry. So William James talked about artificial neurons in 1890, already, before Cajal. Yes, and, and Sherrington as, as well, Sherrington. But, but, but it immediately dismissed them. Sherrington dismissed it. Okay, so you think, oh, Cajal said... He... No, Cajal, no, uh, William James. William James, okay. The other one that was talking about something like that was Freud. He talked about the phi and psi neurons. Okay, thank you very much, Rodrigo. So I will correct that. So you say back in the 19th century, yeah. There were two people who were making th yeah. this suggestion. And even before the neuron doctrine of Cajal. Uh -huh. It was quite... quite <coughs> okay, <coughs> I stand corrected. Uh, one guy who has recently been pushing this is uh, Jeff Bowers from Bristol. He had a paper, this is Psych Review, on the biological pause of new grandmother cells. Uh, another paper from him here. I, I pushed this in a, in a chapter in Visual Population Codes a bit. Um, grandmother cells in man. Well, we've heard about uh, Rodrigo, but uh, uh, they, these are very sophisticated cells, but uh, I, I, I presume you still have the same position. These are not grandmother cells, and I would agree. I would agree, because the hit rate is too high. Uh, you recall from 100 neurons, you show 100 pictures, and half, you know, half the time you're going to get at least one neuron that only responds to one of the stimuli, right? Now, uh, uh, and this is from this, this paper, if you assume you've got a certain number of neurons, and you're and you, uh, you take uh, Biedemann's 30,000 objects, uh, you know, each cell is having to respond to 100 to 150 different objects. Uh, but actually, I think the number of uh, identifiable things is way higher, so it, it's even worse than that. Uh, now, Rafi Malek, as you know, uh, has this idea of totem pole cells, the cells which actually have respond to lots of totally different things. And you were saying that actually the cells tend to, to respond if, you, if they have you know, uh, uh, Luke Skywalker and... Uh, and um, what's the yeah. name? <laughs> yeah. They tend to be semantically related somehow. But anyway, um, the key, key question, though, is this is in the hippocampus, and I really don't think we have grandma cells in the hippocampus, so I'm 100% aligned with well, Rigo on that. But the question is, what, what's happening in the cortex? Do, uh, are there in the human cortex the equivalent of this, but much more sparse? We don't really know. The <laughs> alternative is it's a, you know, a, a heim sompolinsky type distributed network, and the hip, hippocampus puts it all together in one step. You know, maybe true, but it just doesn't seem particularly likely. So at least you know, uh, we, have, we have to explain how these neurons get to be so clever at responding to anything associated with Jennifer Aniston and so on. And it's got a couple of synapses to do it, maybe 150 milliseconds, uh, so we can, we can play with that thing, if you like. Um, so Edmund, I think, uh, it's fair to say, you're definitely, you don't like this, do you? Uh, yeah, they don't have the right properties. I'm very interested. Ah, good, right. You definitely prefer distributed coding, and, 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 and I think you can, have, you can have distributed coding as well, as I show, showed with, uh, uh, and I was asking at breakfast, I was asking Alessandro what his position, he was, he was very careful not to, not, to not, to not say anything, actually, so I don't know. But Haim uh, Sompolinsky, he, he, he regretted not being there to the end, but he actually sent me this, so, uh, um, <laughs> so this is, this is arrived in the middle of the night, for, for, and Haim's position is that, yes, Google Net has grandmother cells at the output, but, uh, but everywhere else it's distributed, and uh, there's no reason why you have to do that, basically. I mean, uh, I'll let you read all that uh, at your leisure, I think. But it's a really uh, interesting question. We know how to make grandmother cells if you're Google. Oh, can we read that a bit more? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll give, you, I'll give you two minutes. 
Imagine Haim talking, talking to you at this very moment. Okay? Uh, yeah, you'll get to see, see this. I, I, I can send you all that all. So, you know, in my 1989 thing, I sort of I took uh, what I thought were the main criticisms. Um, you know, and I, here's, here's one of them. There aren't enough neurons in the brain. Depends what you're counting. If you count the number of possible stimuli, this is clearly the case. If you imagine that the retina has a million fibres and you just count the number of binary patterns that you can produce with that retina, it's, it's two to the million. If you had one neuron for every pattern, you would have a brain larger than a known universe. That is not how the, we do it. What would be more sensible is to generate on the fly neurons for those patterns that repeat, not to have pre-existing neurons for everything. That's a, that's a disaster. Coding by single cells is too risky. There's not enough redundancy. Neurons die. Yeah, they, they dry. But you know, if you've got two copies rather than one, then the problem disappears immediately. No one has ever found a grand weather cell. Well, that was back in 1989. I argued at the time that you know, some of them actually look a bit like that. You know, now I think we have things that... Uh, uh, Rodrigo, has, have you had a patient with, whose grandmother... Uh, uh, have you tested their grandmother? That's the first one. I, give, I remember I gave it to me in the MIT, and somebody that will mention the name, he said, don't show these neurons. <laughs> and so I was showing a, a response to the grandmother of the patient. And he was really like, don't show these neurons. <laughs> 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 Who was saying that, actually? <laughs> that would have been the first grandmother. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, so, you know, well, it, the the first first you buy the phone. Um, there's a the claim that individual neurons are unreliable. Actually, they're not. Uh, uh, they're, if you record a neuron and you present a stimulus a hundred times, it doesn't always do the same thing. But that's not unreliable. That just means you're not controlling all of its inputs. You know, the brain is in a, you know, a, a neuron in the cortex is has 99% of its inputs come from outside, uh, off, uh, uh, not from the retina. So that doesn't mean it's unreliable. You would lose the advantages of distributed coding. I don't believe that, because you can have your cake and eat it. You can have a distributed code, and every now and then you have a grandmother cell when you think it's useful. So, you know, why rule out the possibility of having both? And then you have the... the uh, this actually, I added this one. Nobody knows how to make a grandmother cell. Well, I've just shown you how to make one. It's dead easy. You just use STDP uh, in a few presentations, uh, and actually, with a bit of oscillations, you can get it uh, to work in, in one trial. And in, the key is controlling the percentage of input neurons that can fire and setting a threshold at a value which is not gonna, where it's not going to go over that value by chance except once in 100 years. And it's really not difficult. And if you do that, you've got neurons which are selective and will stay selective indefinitely. Uh, and that raises, the, therefore, the problem of cortical dark matter, is that a plausible thing? So you know, I've shown you that actually it's quite difficult to stop neurons going into this regime. If you keep showing the same thing over and over again, some neurons will tend to get selective to that stimulus. They will inhibit the other neurons, which is actually quite useful. So even if, even if the stimulus is of no interest whatsoever, um, having one neuron that's saying, oh yeah, I've heard that before, and inhibiting the other things is actually quite useful. And as an illustration, when I moved to the French countryside, and we bought a house near, near the village, uh, and it was a summer, we opened up the, win the windows, and the church clock chimed every hour throughout the night, and it woke me up all night long, the first night. The second night, no problem at all. Is that because my auditory system habituated? No, it's because neurons in my brain learned to code that and, 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 and were able to inhibit the, you know, the waking response. Uh, it's, it's just a, a non-threatening non situation. And, and that, we need those. We need to code everything, even if they're not interesting. So uh, let me just say, if we accept grandmother cells, which is actually not what most people do, but you get a whole lot of stuff for free. Semantic networks, they've been around since the 50s. Spreading activation models have been around since the 60s. And for some reason, none of these things, uh, these are all things in artificial intelligence, but you know, these sort, of, these sort of semantic networks where you just link things together, you know, everybody's using them, you know. 
And yet, we don't know how to translate that into neurophysiology. neurophysiology. Why? Because people are so re reluctant to buy the, uh, the grandmother cell idea. But once you've done that, you've got, you've got a perfectly you know, adequate memory model where you, know, you have nodes, like in you know, PDP models for words and so on, and you just link them together. And, and so you can do all sorts of memory stuff if you buy the grandmother cell idea. <laughs> but of course, you could say, oh, it's all done with uh, Heim Sompolinsky -Somp style distributed codes where all the neurons are firing all the time and you have to have a consolidation process kicking in every now and then to make sure you don't forget the old stuff and so on. But it just seems to me, I don't, I don't see what the problem is, to be quite frank. Yeah. We actually did that with, with real data. Yeah. And you can do it even if you don't have grammar cells, because you can define versus on the neural data, you can define a distance between concepts. So if, yeah, the, yeah. if the neuron fires the same way to do, to do concepts, you will say that distance is small. And you end up with things like that. Right, I agree. Uh, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can try and make a, a, a semantic network in distributed memory systems. But the more sparse and the more explicit you made the neurons, the easier it is to read, apart from anything right. else. It is, it is very sparse. No? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, but, yeah. but you could do everything with hot-field hot nets, and that's, and that's what people did for decades. Mm -hmm. But then we, you run into the, you know, the 0.14n uh, limit. You've got 1,000 neurons, you can store 140 patterns, and then you start write, overwriting the, the old ones. Not, not with sparse representations. That's okay. the whole point. The point one four is a regimen. That's for that's for the 50% active thing. Okay, so you uh, so what's the best code then, Edmund? For sparse, with a thousand. Okay, um, so look, the sparse <laughs> distributed code stores roughly a number of patterns. That's the number of connections per neuron divided by something like the sparseness. Okay, so that's so the so the sparser it is, the more patterns. you Okay, store. let's take let's take my. Car counting circuit. It's got uh, it's got thirty two thousand inputs per neuron. I've got sixty of them. What's the total number of patterns that you can store, according to your calculation? Um, how many connections per neuron? Thirty two thousand. Okay, so you can store um, thirty two thousand or so, depending on the sparseness. Really? Well, that's yes. very impressive. Uh, all I can say is I can have sixty neurons, sixty patterns. So it, you, if you can get 32,000 patterns stored in, yes. in that circuit, yes. I, I will buy you a beer. That's what might be. Perhaps 32,000 inputs if you have only 60 neurons. Well, it, no, it's easy. I mean, you know, in a simulation or in some hardware thing. Real neurons, it's tough to get 32,000 connections onto a neuron. But so that was the bottom line of Heim's talk and my talk, in a sense. Yeah. That that's the memory capacity. It depends, depends what your model is. If you've got a distributed memory code like Heim, then, then that number means something. But in my one, uh, the number of, if you've got an input layer and you've got an output layer, the number of patterns you can store is the number of output neurons. Uh, I mean, are you happy with that? Or yeah, sure. in, in that, that version? And I, and yes, now, if it's, if, it, if, it, if it's a system with recurrency, <coughs> yes. but uh, I'm not using recurrency, yeah, there are no. Right. So your capacity is N, <coughs> where you have N neurons. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, do we have dark matter? What's, uh, we, for that, we need to know what the true distribution of firing rates is. And it's not the, uh, you know, every time you record a neuron, you measure its firing rate, because you might have lots of neurons which are just not doing anything. Sorry. Can I ask a question about yeah. grammar cell? Yeah. Uh, is this, uh, once it exists, uh, invariant? Nothing to do with um, yeah, it depends, well, uh, you know, right from... The very, f uh, do you remember uh, I showed, showed you SpikeNet, where you have a, a neuron detecting a particular face immediately after V1. It's just the orientation map. Now, that neuron responded to all 10 photographs of that person and not to anybody else. That's pretty invariant. Is it in accordance with because, for example, when I see my grandmother from the front view, uh, some spikes, then she turned around and other spice down, but it's big, big down. So. Okay, so, so the, the, the easy way to make a, a, an invariant system is just to learn several views. I mean, Edmund was talking about exactly that. So, you know, if you want to be able to recognize your, recognize your grandma, you, you, you can't do it with one neuron. You know, it doesn't matter where you put it. it if you take the output of the, 
the orientation maps, you have to you have to have view specific views. So you know, one for the front, maybe one for the half profile, one for actually five is enough. Uh, uh, in fact, because there's enough, they they, they cope with, with with a fair bit of three um, D rotation variance. The, uh, so the problem of, of getting these numbers is that actually nearly all neurophysiology is done under conditions where you take your electrode and you're driving through the cortex and, and as soon as you get a cell, then you start testing it. But you're going to be selectively sampling those neurons that have already got some spon spontaneous activity or are responding to your stimuli. And in fact, uh, it was a paper back in 1968 already drew attention to the fact that you ought to be recording far more. And, and, and uh, if you remember, uh, Sylvia said the same thing, you know, that you should be able to record from you know, maybe 100 neurons with every electrode, but it tends to be a lot less than that. And, and, you know, and, and typically, you know, uh, you, people will only describe, you know, maybe 5 to 15 neurons that they record on one track if they're doing single unit isolation. But now we've got all sorts of fancy methods which should... I hope in the next few years answer these problems because you know we got you can leave implanted arrays and just leave them and you know a, a neuron that fired a spike every year would you you, would, you could find it you can't with the current uh, system things like two two photo optical imaging um, you could actually see the neurons fire spikes or you can do patch clamp recording so you actually know the neuron is there and under those conditions, you do find neurons which actually are totally silent. Uh, and you know they're there because you're, you've got your patch electrode on. So my conclusion is that, you know, let's go back to the beginning. Extremely long-term memories are a major challenge, I think. And I'm not sure that anybody else has an option, except if it was epigenetic or prion-based or... Uh, or, or what, what uh, Patrick was talking about yesterday. Maybe, maybe there's some other thing. But you know, if you're trying to do it in synapses, it's actually quite difficult. Um, so one potential explanation is that you know, if we make extremely selective cells, uh, and it's not difficult, you just, uh, you just let them um, learn to, re to respond to repeating <coughs> patterns. We've got a mechanism that works. You can get store patterns within a few, few repetitions, and the trick is to have these inhibitory circuits that control the percentage of neurons that fire in the input layer. If you don't do that, this won't work. Uh, but that leads uh, open the possibility that substantial proportions of neurons may be dark matter. So I would, I would suggest that in the absence of an alternative, you, you should be taking grandmother cells seriously. Now, uh, I have, do have a little bit of time, and I, so I want to do a quick stop press uh, we've actually got a new STDP uh, rule, which we've just patented. And it's, we, we've got an exclusive deal with a company called Brainchip Incorporated. Now, this new rule is even better than the one that I was showing you. In Tim Maskelyi's original stuff, the neurons have to be active to be able to learn. With our new trick, they don't. And, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, the, the, well, first, the first point to make is that we're only using binary synapses. That really helps things. And you can see here, you know, if you've got a sort of grid where spikes come in here, these are the output neurons, you, you don't need to have variable synapses which, you know, go from one value to, from zero to one or whatever. You can just switch on and off uh, binary synapses. So that's the first point. Note that this, is, this sort of architecture is a real non-von Neumann architecture. So note that it's a, it's a computing device which has no CPU. The memory and the computation are together. Now, uh, the new algorithm, uh, let's take a case where we've got 1,024 input channels and 1,024 output channels. Initially, we're feeding total noise into the system. So these are, uh, this is um, random spikes, Poisson processes, uh, so really nothing interesting. And you'll note that there's, uh, none of the output neurons are firing at all. And then at some point, we arbitrarily choose one spike as being the seed for a, for a motif, if you like. So this, this is the, uh, we've just randomly chosen this one. And then one in every two spikes is, uh, is determined to be part of a pattern that we're going to repeat, OK? So there's, uh, the, it's the blue spikes here. And you can see that here, the output neurons are not interested, and it's normal because it's exactly the same as the, the rest of the stuff. On the second presentation, 
you can see the blue spikes are roughly in the same place, but there are the, the grey spikes in the background are random. So it, 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 uh, and look, there are two of the output neurons have decided to fire. By the time you've got the sixth presentation, we've got a whole pile of them firing. And uh, when we test later on, it's actually this system has learned a, a, a red motif and a blue motif. Uh, and so these, these spikes are uh, very reliable. Now, I, I'll actually show you. This is actually um, the full simulation. It's 150 milliseconds of spikes. There are uh, 70,000 spikes in here. Uh, uh, and the grey spikes are not, in, in, in not using the neurons in the pattern. The, red, the blue and uh, red ones are. And, and the, uh, these vertical lines uh, are the, re the repeating motifs, the blue and the red ones. No activity here. The neurons start becoming selective here. Go back to noise, nothing. Come back with the, uh, uh, the pattern, and, and, and there they are again. And as I say, you can leave this period as long as you like. The probability of getting these neurons to fire without the motif is extremely low. Um, so we got learning in less than five trials. And you remember that was the, that was the challenge of the ERP to auditory noise. Uh, we need something that can do this, that can pick up a repeat. Uh, so um, it's an interesting thing. So in that, 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 that version, there were 1,024 inputs, 1,024 outputs. And we can simply calculate the probability of getting at least one selective neuron in the output layer as a function of the number of repeats. Uh, basically, with 1,024 neurons, you really basically have to have seven repeats to be you know, sure of getting at least one cell. Um, but if you double or quadruple the number of output neurons, you can get to a situation where ba basically, uh, even after two repeats, on the second repeat, you would have 70% 70, 70 chance of getting one selective neuron. And after three, you're per basically sure. So just increasing the output numbers of output neurons, so you know, this is N, where the N is the number of output neurons. The more you've got, the more it's easy for the system to detect the things that repeat. So while one neuron can learn a repeating pattern, if you want to be damn sure that, that somebody's going to have found it, just increase the number of neurons in the output layer. Um, and finally, We've got this running on an FPGA. Now, for, for those who don't know about this, this is a chip. This, this chip here costs about $100. It's a programmable device that so you can do, basically do what you want. We've got spikes coming in here, processed here, and the spikes come out here, and we can stick them on the screen or whatever. And this, uh, this is actually, this is running in, we did the entire thing in 14 milliseconds on this chip, okay? Now, this is, I don't know whether real neurons could learn patterns at that speed. But, you know, it's done the whole learning thing and tested and, uh, in 14 milliseconds. It's processing <coughs> 70,000 spikes in 14 milliseconds. And that's really, it's, it, 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 it's, it's only hardware limitation. I mean, we could make another chip next, next month which could handle as many as you want. And, the, uh, and basically, those ideas, I think, are very much... Uh, um, things that can be used in all sorts of things. So, you know, imagine doing audio EEG processing. Basically, anything, any, any analog signals, you can convert them into spikes in the same way as the, the, the cochlea converts, um, you know, sound, sound pressure levels into spikes. And so that's, that's why brain chip uh, is very interested in this, because it it's potentially uh, the applications are enormous. And what I'd like to say is that I think, you know, we are getting close to what makes, uh, you know, our brains really good. It's our ability to spot things that repeat. Um, with, no, with nobody to tell you, learn this. It's just the simple fact of repeating that makes something interesting. If it doesn't repeat, then don't bother. Um, so I mean, what, what, are the, what are the amusing applications, which they're probably going to do, is processing um, data from, uh, from the uh, radio telescopes all over the world looking for extra extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, basically, it's terabytes of data every second. And trying to analyze that stuff is they've got supercomputers, and they completely, they're completely maxed out the supercomputer because there's just so much stuff. But uh, uh, the, the, you know, what, what's, a, what's a characteristic of uh, intelligent life on the, uh, the other side of the galaxy? Well, if it's sending out news reports every 24 hours or the equivalent uh, with the same thing, then, then you would pick it up. <laughs>
So there you go. Um, let, me, let me stop with, with a few minutes for questions. Perhaps... Uh, yeah, no, no, okay. I won't say any more. No. <laughs> Edmund. Um, I have just a quick comment, um, Simon. Uh, it looks as if, and I'd like to know your view on this, it looks as if you're going towards sort of digital computation. So when we think about a neuron, might have 20,000 inputs yeah. in the neocortex, and we think it takes about 100 of those to be active to fire a neuron, and we think it's doing a <coughs> dot product similarity or correlation computation. Mm. Now, it looks to me as if you want neurons for your system, which are doing sort of digital combinatorial it, Effectively, that's right. Basically, yes. That. So it's as if you've got a kind of a digital computer yep. that you're using, yep. whereas the brain is normally thought of as an analog ah, okay. type computer. So yeah. you know, your comments on that would be interesting. Well, OK, so if you go and measure the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the, the voltage or the current produced by a particular synapse being activated, you'll find all sorts of values. And you might say, oh, therefore, you know, our model has to have continuously variable uh, EPSP uh, amplitudes. Now, the, the thing is, I think that is true. However, when you want the system to store something and it has to last for the rest of your life, you do not want to have a synapse where you're trying to keep the, you know, the uh, EPSP value at you know, 0.35 millivolts. What you want is a thing where it just says it's on or it's off. So yes, in the end, I'm, 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 I'm going to preach for digital. And in fact, the, the, the algorithms we have, they, d they don't even have an analog stage. It's all digital because we're just, swi we're just switching synapses on and off. That doesn't mean that, you know, that that's how one should do a proper vol model of the biology, but it's enough to get the learning to occur. Very interesting. Alessandra. So, thank you related to this, but uh, one of the, of the problems that modern society in advanced countries that have rejected grandmothers, grandmothers that uh, <laughs> may be taken in by yes. the family or by the in-laws. And uh, it seems to me that that's the crucial uh, issue in your uh, vision. Why, why, why is grandmother so unpopular? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is, if you have a, you, you have a new grandmother, that, uh, like your mother-in-law, that you, you need to uh, allocate yeah. new grandmother cells. Yeah. What you you talked about uh, purely a simple mechanism like threshold setting, but uh, what would uh, make the neurons that are already encoding another grandmother uh, avoid this new grandmother relative to the neurons that are not already? Okay, so I'm assuming that you know, some old lady comes into my life, yeah. uh, I, whether or not she's you know, my mother-in-law or not, I will have to code at her if, I, if, she, if, she, if she keeps turning up all the time because you know, she's on the bus or something. Um, um, then the labelling of you know, she's the mother-in-law comes afterwards. You, you, you have to, the suggestion is, as long as you've got some free neurons uh, uh, and there aren't already neurons that will, uh, are doing a sufficiently good job, and oh, that, that's actually I want something I really want to insist about. Most of the time we don't learn everything, uh, we, you know, um, fortunately. Why don't we learn all the time, given that we can learn auditory noise in five trials? Well, the reason I think is that most of the things we get to see are actually quite close to things we've already seen or heard. And so we've got neurons that are saying, oh, that's all right, know that one. And so we don't bother to learn. But as soon as you make the stimulus totally new, and that's the case with auditory noise, because it literally has no resemblance to anything you've ever heard before, you are forced to learn. And the fact is that our adult subjects do this, you know, even without thinking about it. Um, so the, the real reason why we don't normally learn all the time and we can drive to work and not remember anything, is that everything we see normally on the way to work are stuff that we've already learned. And, and so the brain is always saying, you know, know that, know that, know that, know that, know that. And it's only when something new happens, like a, you know, a, a weird fractal pattern on a, on a poster, uh, you'll say, oh, that's interesting. Um, I better learn that, especially if you, do, if you see it every day. So <coughs> I think uh, releasing... 
learning depends, and what, the reason why it gets harder and harder to learn anything new is because we basically <coughs> we've learned most of the things. Uh, you'd have to come up with something totally original. I see it, so we've got 30 seconds left. Um, well, we've got responses to ourselves, no? I'm sorry? We do get responses to ourselves when the patient didn't know us before. Yes, yes, so absolutely. So, as good as so fortunately, you know. fortu I think basically we have to have enough neurons in the neocortex so that during a, a normal lifetime there's always enough pre-stuff around that you can learn something new, I guess.